Welcome everyone to this episode of Changing Minds. This is me, Owen Fitzpatrick, and I'm delighted and excited to be interviewing a very dear friend of mine. Adam Ashton is the co-host of an incredible podcast called What You Will Learn. And What You Will Learn is a podcast that he's done with the wonderful Adam Jones. And it's a breakdown of all of these incredible books, hundreds of books on this podcast have they read and broken down in a very fun way. I was a fan of this podcast when I first heard about it a few years ago, and I listened to so many of the episodes. And then during COVID, I reached out to the lads and we got connected. And I think they were doing some sort of Q&A or something. And I reached out and we got talking. And then we had a few conversations, video chat conversations during COVID. And then I brought them on the podcast and I can't explain how nice it is to have people that I could talk to that have that similarity with myself. Reading is a huge, huge thing for me. I love it. And it <laughs> is a real pleasure to be able to talk about it with people who are doing that and every week are coming up and reviewing a new book. He's also the co-author of a number of books and his initial first book, was this book here i'm just going to find it which is the shit they never taught you and as you can see it's just a small book not <laughs> a very light reading it's the kind of thing you bring to the beach no this is a wonderful book this is something that i've given as a gift to a number of people it is literally tons and tons of books inside here which are all the two atoms have broken them down and given you the most important nuggets in here so it's a really wonderful gift book it's big but it has so much wisdom in it. I mean, this has hundreds of books summarized inside of it. And so I highly recommend the shit they never taught you. Now I know this is starting to sound like a, an infomercial, but I'm also excited because I got ordered the, the new book, Attitude, which is their latest book, smaller book. Adam, do you have a copy to show? So see, uh, that is a beach book. That's something <laughs> you can easily take to the beach this summer. But yeah. attitude, see, look how quick <laughs> that is. That's a plane trip read. And yet having gone through it, I could tell you right, right from the get go, it's going to be epic. And it really is. There's some great ideas in there. And one of the things before I finish introducing Adam, one of the things that makes uh, the two Adams so brilliant at what they do is they have a wonderful ability to synthesize information in a way that takes the stuff that you've already read or already know and just makes it more meaningful and more practical and applicable. And that's exactly what we're going to get into today. So I'm delighted to introduce my friend who was also a first time father, which so big congratulations on that. Incredible, I'm sure, and full on, but <laughs> love to introduce to you all the wonderful Adam Ashton. Thanks a lot, mate, for being on. Great to see you again, my friend. It is good to be back. I think this is our fourth appearance. Well, third interview, but one got a rerun actually. So I guess we can claim fourth. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yeah. To me, as I said, I just love talking to you guys. So it's my pleasure to talk to you today anyway, podcast or no podcast. But I figured we may as well give all of my phenomenal listeners an opportunity to be able to dive in. But anyway, to get straight into it, mate, let's talk about a book that I think is extremely good written by two phenomenal people the wonderful book attitude and this is a book that in a nutshell i think the key lesson is that life is unpredictable and full of stuff that you can't control the only thing we truly have control over is our attitude and of course that's not a new idea victor frankl most popularly i suppose said that in man's search for meaning where he said they could take away every freedom we have except for the last of the human freedoms a person's own ability to choose their own attitude in any given set of circumstances right so the notion itself simple but i love what you've done in exploring this book and in, in the way you've been able to extract some core key ideas because i think oftentimes we look at attitude and we go oh it's simply a case of being positive you're familiar with the belief leadership stuff that i'm working on and doing and I've got my own take on the importance of belief and the difference between beliefs and attitudes and opinions and whatnot. But what I love about your book is that you break it down into five key elements, five key areas. So I'd love to dive into each one. But if you want to just give us a idea as to where did the idea for the book come? Why did you guys decide to write not only a book like this, but also to topic it all around attitude? Yeah, totally. Well, we did the big papa, the big yellow beast 
the shit they never taught you, which was 684 pages. We summarized 115 different books in there. It was wide across nine different categories. So like we had a general personal development stuff. We had personal finances. We had marketing. We had philosophy. We had human nature, behavior type stuff. We had some history in there. We had some management. We had some entrepreneurship. So we kind of went broad across a whole range of different topics. So it was a real, I guess, cover the landscape of all the books that we'd read. Whereas next we're like, okay, now we want to go deep on a very specific area. So the plan was to obviously physically go a lot shorter and a lot smaller book, but we wanted to make sure it was like super valuable to that one specific area. And the plan originally was like, oh, we want to do one about yourself, one about relationships with other people. And then one's like your relationships with the world more broadly. And the plan was the first one was the mindset stuff. The second one was like teamwork, management, relationship type stuff. And then we're like, this is getting too big. Let's just zoom in on this mindset type book. But mindset was kind of taken. We love the book mindset. It's probably in our top five or six books ever. So we're like, well, we can't call it mindset. Let's go attitude. Excellent. Love it. And again, it very much hits hits home with that title. Basically, just to let everybody know, the five elements that you talked about were vision, change, learning, fear, and boldness. If you want to walk us through in terms of vision, what do you mean specifically by vision? I mean, we all have different ideas and different notions, obviously the business element of vision, but is it simply a case of having a clear perspective of exactly where you want to go? And what are some nuances that people will learn as they go through the vision part of the book? Yeah, I think what you said there was the key is like everyone's going to get somewhere over the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years, you're going to get somewhere. Very few people, I think, at the start of that 20-year journey, pick where they want to go. Very few people set that vision at the very start saying, this is the direction I want to head in. So we're all going to get somewhere. And if we're not careful, it might not be where we want to end up. So we want to make sure that right at the very start, we're really crafting a vision for ourselves. For me personally, it's not specific, like you're setting very specific goals. It's more like the direction that you want to head in though. It's more about the intentionally choosing where you want to go. Because if you don't intentionally choose where you want to go, someone's probably going to choose it for you uh, if you just kind of go with the flow. And I think as well as that is that when we do choose intently where we want to go, we also have to recognize that it needs to be exciting, right? So Mm. the things that even in terms of research around goal setting, and I know this isn't goals, like you said, it's a direction you want to go in. But one of the pieces of research around like the release of dopamine and whatnot is that whenever we have something we're going after, and that could be an overarching vision, or it could be a large goal that helps us move towards that vision. But it should be something that we're not 100% sure that we can definitely achieve it. And it should be something Mm. that we think is not impossible either. It should be something we think, you know what, if I really go for it, I think I could achieve this vision. So there's an excitement Mm. to that. Now, I know you kind of touch on that at the very end when we talk about boldness, right? Boldness to go after your vision. But I, I do think that when we're talking about peak experience and your ability to be able to achieve something magnificent, would it be fair to say that visions like that, visions that inspire you are the best kind of visions to go for? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. You want it to be enough of a stretch without snapping, I guess you want to stretch yourself to the point of like, this is possible, but or probably just, as you say, kind of like just on the edge of possible, like maybe slightly beyond the edge of possible is probably going to be enough to get you excited and get you motivated to really start working towards it. And then you also, in the second part, you go a second section, rather you go into change. And one of the mm. things you do is you talk about some of the obstacles to change. This is something that I spend a lot of time talking to people about. So it's the obstacles. What stops people from changing? And what are the things that gets in the way? You talk about the difference between the beach bum and the millionaire. It's, I suppose that decision to be able to go in one direction and to always know you're going from one place to another. Now, some people might argue with you and say, well, the beach bum, they're probably living life large. They're probably loving their life. You know what I mean? Because they might not have the money, but they're doing what they want to do. But in many ways, to make the changes, to make the shifts, it's not simply a case of just being motivated. Okay, I'm motivated to change. It's also about the disciplines. Could you talk a little bit about that? And also particularly when you talk about making diamonds and share some of the Mm. insights from that section. Yeah, so that section on change, we take The Slight Edge, How to Change by Katie Milkman and Beyond Order, 12 More Rules for Life and kind of and mush them together in our own sort of personal mix. 
when it comes to change, you can take the easy path, but unfortunately the easy path is probably not going to get you back to that vision that we were talking about earlier. The easy path is the chocolate bar instead of the apple or sitting on the couch instead of going for a walk around the block. In the short term, it doesn't really matter, but you do that every day for 20 years, there's going to be a massive difference at the end of it. The idea of making diamonds is like you need that little bit of pressure. If a carbon goes deep underground and is subject to intense heat and pressure, and at the end comes out like this magnificent, valuable, precious element, the kind of the same is true of humans as well. If humans go down and deep, we get subjected to heat and pressure. We're putting ourselves through the paces. We're doing the hard things. We're making the decisions that aren't comfortable in the short term. Then eventually we're going to come out as that diamond on the other side. That sound, yeah, that sounds very much Peterson-esque in terms of when you describe it like that, very Jordan Peterson. Fear is the thing that stops a lot of people from being able to not only change, but pursue their vision. You talk about the what, the why, and the, I suppose, most significant struggle. Again, what are mm. the key elements that you go through there? Yeah, it's all about reframing fear. Unfortunately, we probably can't stop fear altogether. You probably can't really get rid of your fear. So it's all about reframing your fear. So we sort of reframe why you're afraid and we reframe what you're afraid of. Two great books. One is Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway, which is a bit of a cheesy title. It sounds like that, just whatever, just do it. That kind of know you're fearless, conquer your fear and just get on with it. But it's actually a lot more nuanced than that. And then it reframes what's everyone afraid of? And she takes the ideas of, okay, I'm afraid of spiders. I'm afraid of public speaking. I'm afraid of all these surface level fears, like the thing that you can point to as your fear. And there's hundreds of those fears. Boiling it down from there, it boils down to just six or seven sort of fears that are related to the ego, fear of not being enough, fear of rejection, fear of failure, fear of success. And then it really boils down to just one core fear, which is the fear that you can't handle it. And so the fear of public speaking is kind of like the fear of embarrassment or the fear of rejection, but really it's just like the fear that you can't handle either not succeeding or you can't handle people laughing at you or no one really laughs at you, but that's the fear. And the point of that is, okay, instead of trying to tackle these hundred different fears you've got, the only thing you need to do to conquer all your fears is to really build up the attitude within yourself that you can handle it. Because if you can handle whatever life throws at you, then there's nothing really to be afraid of anymore. I love that. And obviously, Susan Jeffers, author of the book, Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway. That's a classic book. It's well known. There's a lot of really cool things. There's a professor called Kelly McGonigal who wrote a book called The Upside of Stress. And a lot of work by her and other researchers. This is an area I'm spending a lot of time in where they looked at your mindset towards stress and how people who tend to have a lot of stress tend to live shorter lives unless their attitude about the stress is that actually stress is mm. good for you or they have a different way of thinking about stress the point of it is it's not that stress is good for you per se but it's that when you believe stress is good for you it's less likely to be harmful for you so your mindset has an impact on that and that's what i call anti-fragile stress sort of borrowing that term anti-fragile nice. but the notion is that when you look at stress as being something that benefits you when you go out and you're running and you see the pain that you're feeling or how hard it is being something that's good for you that actually transforms it in terms of your experience of it in the body and from what i'm hearing you say it seems a similar kind of notion in that mm. you're translating that stress you're transforming that stress or that fear in your case into something that's beneficial or empowering does that make sense yeah, absolutely. I love it. Maybe we should have read a few more books to squeeze into no, attitude. I'm telling you, I'm telling yeah. you, that book, the, the upside of, of stress is a great one. I definitely put that on. Yeah. You constantly put new books on my reading list. So I'm happy to do the same for you. But she's really sharp. She's mm. really good and translates a lot of like neuroscience stuff into simple forms. Her and Aliyah Crum, who hasn't released a book, but there's a lot of research studies out there in the area of mindset. The two of them are worth checking out. But then we have, uh, oh, sorry, we skipped learning. So learning, I, I gather you got a little bit from the talent code of this. So what are some of the key elements of learning in that area? Yeah, I think we kind of touched on the breaking it down into those Lego blocks that it's kind of, if you think about playing golf as an example of a new skill that you want to learn to play golf is like 
a whole bunch of mini skills really stacked up together. There's driving off the tee, there's hitting wedges versus irons versus woods. There's approaching the green, there's chipping, there's pitching, there's putting, there's hitting out of the sand. There's trying to hold the cigar in your mouth and look really cool when you're putting. Like all these skills that really add up that you, if you just go out to the golf course and say, I'm going to play nine holes, you could be playing for a hell of a long time because you're going to suck big time compared to if you broke it down into small skills, you went and played around a mini golf to practice your putting. You went to the driving range to practice your driving. If you could break it down into those small skills, you're going to actually get to the big skill a lot quicker. Fantastic. Like we talked about before. And then finally, boldness. You talk about Ricky Branson, David Goggins, and Malala. And again, who would have thought the same section would include a chapter on David Goggins and a chapter on Malala? So <laughs> I love that. I absolutely love it. So what are the key takeaways from the notion of boldness and what these three individuals have in common? Yeah. So if I've kind of spoke about it, you set your vision, you realize that from where you are to where you want to be, there might be a bit of a gap. So you're going to need to make some changes. In order to make those changes, you're going to need to learn some new things. When you're learning new things, it's scary as shit. So you're going to have to overcome your fears. At the end of that though, there's still probably going to be something lingering there. You're still going to need that little bit of boldness to overcome it, to that Tony Robbins, make your move, pump a fist to the chest and step into the arena. So the boldness we want to take, obviously there's a whole bunch of different types of boldness. We've got Branson, sort of the uh, risk-taking, entrepreneurial risk-taking. There was Malala was sort of the moral boldness to take us to make a stand. Goggins, very physical boldness to do all the crazy shit that he's done. And just, we want to use those stories to kind of paint the picture of, this is just probably the last sort of element you need to do the previous things. You need a bit of boldness in to, to add to the mix. Fantastic. Look, I love it. I think it's great. I think that, uh, again, bringing David Goggins, Malala and Richard Branson into a section, you guys, and uh, one of the things I really value and appreciate about you is how well you're able to make it fun to learn about all this sort of stuff. Obviously, I'm obsessed with it anyway, but I know that there's a lot of places where a lot of these ideas are not nearly as fun or as enjoyable as they could be. And you two do a phenomenal job both in your podcast and also in the books to be able to make these things fun. So I'm excited to dive in and I know I've sort of skimmed over what I've seen so far, but I'm really excited to go through the book and also to check out some of those podcast episodes. Just one more question for you, Adam, what is in store in the future? Anything that you want to give us a teaser on that hot off the press that you haven't actually yeah. done a podcast episode on to give my listeners even more reason to tune in to the forthcoming episodes. Yeah. I've got some awesome books that we've read that are sitting on like my, they've been read, notes have been made, but episodes have not been recorded yet. There's a few classics that I reckon you're like, how have you not done this already? So Made to Stick by the Heath, Heath. Brothers. Yeah. That'd be way up your alley. Blink yes. by Gladwell, yeah, Gladwell as well. Yeah. Nudge as well. We're finally getting Great. around to it. Need we read favor. it like... Right. Yeah, we read it like years ago and are finally getting around to it. Breakthrough Advertising, have you read that one? Yes, actually, I got that now. That's the book, by the way, for everybody. It's this book that was champion. It's from years ago, like a long mm. time ago. But at least a few years ago, like four or five years ago, I came across it. Everyone was like, this book is worth hundreds of dollars. This book is the most like it's gem. And you go through and eventually I got my hands on a copy. I mean, it's very good. But once again, a big part of it is how well it was sort of marketed. It's yeah. like the Bible of advertising. <laughs> Definitely. Well, be fair, they, they did very well. And then one I really liked, a bit left to center, was Wild Problems by Russ Roberts. Do you recommend it? Uh, yeah. I definitely would. I really liked it. It's kind of like decision making when you can't make a decision, like when the decision, so like the decision of to get married or not, or who to marry, or should you have kids or not, or should you move to a different country or not? Should I completely sh change careers? Like the decision making where the simple pros and cons list just isn't going to cut it. Okay, cool. Excellent. All right. That yeah. sounds great. Uh, <laughs> I always, the problem with talking to you is that I always walk away with a bunch more books to read. So, you know. I've... What about you? What's what's some books? You know, oh, the other one that I haven't mentioned as well, Quit by Annie Duke. Look, um, Annie I'm... Duke, I'm a huge fan. Uh, anything she writes, I'm a huge fan. I think Thinking and Best is one of the best books on behavioral economics out there. Mm -hmm. And obviously, Thinking Fast and Slow, to me, is one of the classics. It gets a little heavy, but it's Big a time. classic. But I think 
thinking in bets is one of the best ones. I know Dana really and a bunch of others are, have some great books out there, predictably rational and whatnot, but a nudge is pretty solid. But I read, I think Annie Duke, even how to decide her second book. I think she's a great author. I find mm. her so brilliant. In terms of other recommendations, I'd say, obviously I'm all into belief at the moment. So how mm. might change by David McGraney is great. Nice. He's also a podcast host of a great podcast that you're not that smart. I think it's called. Nice. And uh, let me see the expectation effect by David Robson, mm. another brilliant book. These are the kind of books. My, that... my mom read that and she said, I should read it. And because oh. mom recommended to me, I didn't read it. <laughs> so it's, if you've recommended it, then it's, I'll, it's I'll take solid. your recommendation. You know why it's solid? It's solid because he goes in, he breaks down everything with research, evidence, evidence, evidence. The expectation effect annoyed me because it's very much in line with the book that I'm working on. How might <laughs> change annoyed me because it's very much in line with the book that I'm working on. That's so right. the books that I'm recommending to you are the books that annoy me because they're very closely connected <laughs> to what I've been working on. I definitely recommend the Lisa Feldman Barrett books that I mentioned that we mentioned off air, which is how emotions are made and the seven and a half lessons, seven and a half lessons about the brain. And there was one other one I wanted to mention to you. I think you might enjoy exactly what to say, Phil M. Jones. It's just a little different take on language. It's a very short book as well, but I've got to meet Phil and he's a really good guy, but it's a very simple book, but yet I'm very quick to read, but there's some nice nuggets in there. Magic Words, nice. by Jonah Bird, <laughs> other one. That's one I recommend for sure. And if you haven't read Influence since Cialdini added the seventh principle of unity i definitely recommend give it another go because he adds lots of research to it it's now a bit of a mammoth of a book so it's, it's like triple the size <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah i was gonna ask you about magic words actually i could see catalyst behind you there which we recently read and loved yeah. and obviously is contagious absolutely yeah. loved as well he's a very good writer of making it enjoyable He's a great science writer. Like Jonah Berger is one of the better writers of books around influence and persuasion out there to me. So I think that Catalyst is great. Contagious, as you mentioned, is excellent. And Magic Words is really good. Like for me. Because that just came out, right? It just Recently? came out. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I didn't learn a massive amount, but the only reason I didn't learn a massive amount is because I've been mad into language, obviously from the NLP mm. stuff. And then I wrote a book a few years ago, which I never released actually called what was it called it was to do with what i call linguistic intelligence so i went in not just at the nlp stuff but the psychology of language my master's thesis was analyzing language of gurus and that was back in 2003 i've taught advanced wow. language skills courses so i had a massive amount of a background mm. to a lot of the stuff i still got a few things that i didn't know which to me i was delighted with but i think most people when they read it they'll get a lot of nuggets what is great about it is how practical it is it's very much here's a word and here's when to use it. And so I definitely recommend it. It's an easy enough read. It's a fun read. It's one of the better books that have come out in the last few months. So that's it. That's another one. So, yeah. How come you wrote a book and didn't release it? You know, it just wasn't good enough. I mean, I'm not saying that <laughs> yeah, the rest of my that's... books are great, but there's two books that I've written that I've co-written one of them. Maybe I co-wrote both of them, but did a, a lion's share of work on them. One was on language and that was a good few years. That was maybe seven or eight years ago. And the other was during COVID, wrote a book, basically wrote a book on rethinking things. And it was a great book. We we're really happy with it. But 55,000 words was the first draft. And then Adam Grant brought a book called Think Again. Uh <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't even know about it. But as soon as myself and my friend who had written it together, as soon as we saw that book, we're like, <laughs> Because <laughs> we were so excited. We were like, this is new. No one's ever talked yeah. about this before. And it was a different book in the sense that, but it just, the motivation dropped out because mm. all of this work we'd done about this being the newest thing that anyone ever seen. Yeah. And then all of a sudden they were like, Adam Grant just- You're just, you just ripping again. him off. Yeah. Originals I thought was amazing. Yeah. But I think again, I was like, just so, so. I suppose I had already primed because of the nature of the topic. I was already primed to like it. Yeah. But um, so you basically wrote the book. <laughs> well, there you go. Well, you see, that's the problem. The problem is he's such a great writer that comparing the two as well, even beforehand, uh, wasn't something that made me happy. <laughs> and we had a really good solid, though. We had a framework in it, which. He didn't mm. really have, he had the no. for the scientist and the whatever, but mm. a very clear framework as to how to rethink. 
Nice. But look, good for him. He's a solid writer. So yeah, we've got a couple of books in the past that weren't released. I'm very excited about the book I'm written. The one I'm working on at the moment about belief, it'll be my 10th book. And it's the book that I'm most excited about in terms of getting it out there. I really want to make sure it's as good as possible because I've been working on my writing and I'm not as good a writer as I want to be. And that's why I really want to make sure that I'm getting as good as possible to make this the best expression of my work possible. So that's what's, what's in store at the moment. So yeah. Yeah. We, we've given each other a bunch of stuff to, to look into anyway. Well, the current book's probably keeping you busy, but what can we re co-write after that one? What would be our next book? You know, I think for you, given what you've written before and given what you've read, I think there's some magic in this book that I would have written if I had the time and it wasn't just one of many ideas. I think a book on what are the most misunderstood things out there. So, so if you go through all the books you read, every time you were surprised and you go, wow, right? So for example, when I read Lisa Feldman Barrett's book, How Emotions Are Made, it made me look at everything I'd ever thought about how the brain worked mm. and how emotions happen. And I immediately realized, hang on a second, I think I might be wrong. And if you look at Eric Barker wrote a great book called Barking Up the Wrong Tree, where each section of the book is him identifying a myth, something we think is true, and actually explaining why it's not. And I love that book. I thought it was a great book. Nice. He's written another follow-up called Plays Well with Others. But I definitely recommend to start with that book. But I think for you both, given how much you've read, the beauty in what you come up with is when you come up with the insights that most people aren't aware of, right? And that most people, whenever they think about, let's say, attitude or positive thinking or whatever, they don't really realize, actually, that's not what works. This is what works. Those mm. kind of things. For example, when you achieve goals, what they've shown is that just visualizing what you want over and over again isn't the best way to succeed what you really need to do is mental contrasting. And that is being able to figure out what is it that you want to achieve, but also predict what are the things that will stop you and then contrast and go back and forth between what are the things in your way versus what can you do about them? Or Annie Duke's notion of pre-mortems, where you imagine yourself having failed and then you revert back to what did you do in the lead up to that failure? Like to me, that's just gold because it's a counterintuitive way of thinking. And to me, given how the breadth of work that you've both read, there's got to be a lot of nuggets in there that are counterintuitive insights that get us thinking differently about the field of professional and personal development. So we go, really? And to me, mm. you can write a whole book called Really? Um, <laughs> walks through all that. And that's just off the top of my head, but that's something that I think immediately, I like it. certainly appealing to people like me. I think it's tough to do, but if you can do that, they're probably the types of books that really get me going, like range, because there was the outliers and the grit of work really hard, do 10,000 hours. That's kind of the way to success. But then range came along and was like, oh, well, you can do the Tiger Woods path, but you can also do the range path of doing a little bit here, a little bit there, and then they all kind of stack together. So something like that, something like, well, Annie Drew quit, which is kind of the opposite of grit. Her yeah. newest book saying here, you should, it kind of really... That's, shifts your perspective on you don't just have to work hard actually sometimes quitting is the right thing to do like the ones that just go against the grain can really get me going and you could have both of them against each other so again eric yeah. read that book that he wrote because he kind of does this in this format again it's called i've got it right here Back i haven't read it well, it's been on my shelf for four plus years i reckon i would stick that up there on your list just because <laughs> it's an easy read I'll put it next to read yeah, it is really good. But again, the key is, as you pointed out, like with, for example, grit versus quit, like to me, there's lots of opportunities to be, and I think he might even touch on it. Actually, one of his chapters does touch on that. He doesn't obviously reference Danny Duke book because it wasn't written, but he yeah. goes into, you know, that notion. So I definitely, yeah, I think that would be wonderful because there is an awful lot of, like everybody's an expert now, mate. Like everyone, because especially since COVID, people are becoming coaches. People definitely have the, and I know it was, again, even the Dunning-Kruger effect, that was even like, there's some dubious challenges with regards to how valid that the Dunning-Kruger effect is. But the notion intuitively feels true is that a lot of people think that they're they're hundred percent right about this and they will yeah. prophesize to you about how this is definitely the way to go. And I think 
helping people realize that there's other choices that succeeding and being happy in life. Like, for example, I have this theory about happiness where I take, for example, the notion of the Eastern philosophy of happiness and the Western philosophy. And so I break it down and the Eastern philosophy is contentment and feeling good and being present in the moment. So this is mindfulness. This is meditation. This is acceptance. This is gratitude. And then on the other side, the Western form of happiness, which is success, achievement, you do mm. this, you get pleasure, which is very much motivation, Tony Robbins, success, setting goals, targets, all that sort of stuff. And if you look at it, I also connect it to neurochemicals. So on one side, we have for contentment and security, serotonin, right? Serotonin's linked to feeling content, feeling secure, feeling happy about the way things are. Whereas dopamine is driving us constantly towards achieving more and more. And so the key is that you need balance mm. because so often, if you've got too much dopamine, that will lower your level of serotonin often. And if you've got a lot of serotonin, that can negatively impact how much dopamine. So in many ways, it's the balance of both. And yet you've got people that are just like all about mindfulness, just be in the moment, just this, just that. And you've got mm. the other people that are like, no, 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 success, success, achieve it. You can be wealthier, you can be happier. So to me, there's so much juice in the idea of being able to balance those, if that makes mm, sense. Like the false dichotomies. It's not just A or B, it's maybe a little bit of both. Maybe it's C or Q or Z. Exactly, exactly. Well, look, uh, speaking of Z, I know it's late where you are, so it's probably good for you <laughs> to get a few Cs, especially with a little baby. Thank you so much, mate, for coming on. It's been so good chatting with you. I would like to recommend everybody checks out the podcast what you will learn i promise you you'll love it if you like this podcast you'll love that one as well and also could you share with everyone what's the best way to get their hands on the book attitude yeah if you go to what you will learn.com slash attitude we've got the teaser of what the book is about and then we've got all the links there on where you can buy it we did get hacked our website recently so hopefully when you go to that website it's up hopefully we've solved it if not we've been attacked again Otherwise, just go to Amazon and search for Attitude by Adam Ashton and Adam Jones. Thanks very much, mate. As always, a pleasure. Please <laughs> tell the other Adam I was asking for him. Absolutely, mate. Thanks for letting me take you off course a bit. And good to chat again. And mate, this is the first podcast I've done on Attitude because I was like, my man, Owen, he's first up. Thank you. Thanks for the, uh, <laughs> the first dibs. <laughs>